Some people have asked us to make our show cleaner and for us to curse less, so in honor of that today we're going to take a fun educational journey for the whole family. <laughs> I hope you have your learning caps on, cause motherfucker today we're going to learn some shit. Today on GameWorks we're going to learn a little bit about literary theory and how it can apply to video games. We're going to specifically look at a little thing called a framing device. Now to get a really good definition of framing devices, one would have to have some sort of dictionary of literary terms and literary theory, but who has something that nerdy? I mean, why? That's, I do, it's something I own, it's right here in my hand right now. According to the Penguin Dictionary of Literary Terms and Literary Theory, page 330, paragraph 2, words 7 through 22. A framing device is usually a story that contains either another tale, a story within a story, or a series of stories. Thank you, Literary Dictionary. Never leave me. For example, one of the most common framing devices comes in the form of a narrator who is ostensibly separate, though sometimes related to the story that is being told. This narrator is usually the one telling the main story that we as the audience are experiencing. Some famous examples of this in literature are books like Heart of Darkness and Arabian Nights. However, framing devices can be much more complex than this. Think of something like the movie Memento, where there is a quote-unquote correct way of viewing the story in the proper chronological order, but instead we're shown and couched in the context of the main character's short-term memory loss. Seeing the story as he does, as a series of unconnected moments in time that we have very limited context for. Now the question becomes, why do this? If we have a good story on its own, why confuse things by putting it in this weird, layered format? And, most importantly for this show, how can we use that in video games? Well, to answer these questions, we're gonna have to get creative. Oh, Francois, I wish I could be creative. You are a derivative piece of shit. So first, let's look at the story and gameplay of the fantastic PC game, To the Moon. To the Moon opens up with two technicians visiting an old man named Johnny, who is dying. He hired Sigmund Corp to change his memories before he dies to make him believe he went to the moon. The two technicians travel into his memories, working backwards towards his earliest possible memory to implant the desire to go to the moon into him as a child, letting his mind fill in the resulting memories to take him to the moon. As they go back, they see in reverse order the relationship between Johnny and his wife, River. River's mind is slowly degraded over time, showing her making paper rabbits and becoming obsessed with a lighthouse that the couple owns named Anya. As the technicians go back through his memories, they hit a wall that they can't get past in his early teenage years. Assuming that this is far enough back, they implant the desire, but looking back at his later memories, they see nothing has changed. They go back and break through to his early childhood, where they discover that Johnny and River met his children at a carnival. They sit and look at the sky together, and River tells Johnny that she's always believed that the stars are lonely lighthouses. Too far apart to actually talk to each other, so they twinkle at each other to keep themselves from being lonely. Together, the two make a constellation of a rabbit in the sky, with the moon as its stomach. As Johnny leaves, River asks if they'll ever see each other again. Johnny tells her that they can meet again the next day at the carnival, and if they don't, they can always meet on the moon. Later that day, Johnny's mother accidentally kills Johnny's twin brother in a car accident, and feeds Johnny beta blockers to make him forget about his twin which, as a side effect, also makes him forget about his original meeting with River. The technicians implant the desire as a child and make it so his twin doesn't die. This causes River to not appear in Johnny's life at all until Johnny ends up at NASA with an unexplained desire to go to the moon. As they fly off to the moon, the two of them hold hands in the back of the spaceship just as, in the real world, Johnny dies. Okay, so now that we've overviewed the story, let's ask the important question here. Why use a framing device for this story? What do we accomplish by not just telling this story straight and instead telling it through these two technicians? Well, we have to understand the idea of a narrative arc first. So let's go back to my favorite dictionary of literary terms and- wait, what, what's that? It doesn't have a definition of a narrative arc? How could a dictionary of literary terms not have a definition of a narrative arc right when I need it for my episode? Who, who wrote this? Oh god! Damn you, Jim! <sighs> well, we can define a narrative arc by the main parts a story is separated into. So we usually have an interesting introduction to grab the attention of the audience, a slowly rising arc of action until the eventual climax in the third act, followed by a cathartic payoff that finalizes the action and brings the action back down to a final close. Not every story follows this, but it's the basic way that most stories are organized. While this is helpful, having such a formulaic form, I, I guess, can be a very limiting thing to the types of stories that you can tell. What if you have a story that doesn't follow this arc? Well, then you use a framing device to transform the story more closely to this arc. Think about To the Moon in particular. Told in the correct order, this story wouldn't really be that interesting. It would start with a tragic accident and then wind its way down naturally to the end of these characters' lives. There wouldn't really be any tension, as you would know exactly what's going on the entire time, and it would just be a mildly sad story of a mildly unhappy couple. But given the framing device of the technicians going through and changing Johnny's memories, we're giving a much more exciting, tense, and interesting story. 
Even though the facts of the story remain the same, the form is what makes it stand out and intrigue us. Okay, so that's great for just the story elements of the game, but what about the actual, you know, game part? Well, framing devices can be especially handy in video games, even more so than in literature, as a way to creatively invent or add layers of gameplay to stories that might not intrinsically lend themselves to it. Just imagine if this game was about the main character trying to work his way through his marriage and this story. What gameplay elements could there possibly be? Not many that I could think of, and certainly no interesting ones. But because it's framed in the larger narrative of the memory-altering service, we get some fun memory manipulation-based gameplay, as the technicians have to use objects in Johnny's memories that connect to older memories to go further into his past. This actually adds to the depth of the narrative by highlighting what physical objects and settings the main character values. Seeing certain reoccurring tropes, like River's favorite stuffed platypus, coming up over and over as an important object to Johnny reinforces the relationship of the characters and the values of Johnny. This is a trick that could very easily be implemented into many more games, and most excitingly is a technique that is pretty unique to being used in video games. The framing device gives us both a new way to look at the story of these characters, highlighting things that wouldn't be as easily displayed in a quote-unquote normal story, and also gives us a new way of controlling and relating to the story that gives us new ways to play the game in a purely mechanical sense. The implementation of these ideas in this game is really something to see, and I hope to see it used to its full potential in other video games as people realize the strength of framing devices in this medium. Who knew that literary theory of all things could make our video games better? I did! So now let's go ahead and respond to some comments. The Offensive Gamer writes, Hey fuckface, respond to this comment in your video, bitch. No. <clears throat> what, uh, what time is it? Oh, okay, that's good. <clears throat> Wait, fuck! Chris Alter writes on the Shadow of the Colossus video about how to make narrative in video games that Gone Home is another game that does this really well. I completely agree, the synthesis of story and gameplay elements in Gone Home is nothing to laugh at. In fact, it's pretty incredible. The way they use puzzles and gameplay elements to slowly reveal a story to you that you can choose your own involvement in is pretty amazing. There might be an episode about that coming up, but don't tell you when I said that. It's a secret. Now to move on to the comments on the GameWorks extras about the two different types of video gamers. Ink Rose points out that she is definitely more of a story lover. But as I said, people very often value gameplay as well. And she says that our channel deserves more views. Thank you! As always, the main thing that helps us out here is just sharing the videos of people you think would like it, so do that if you want. But yeah, back to the comment, I don't think anybody particularly thinks that video games have to be one thing or the other. Everybody is a synthesis of the two, it just matters where you fall on the spectrum. And that's it for our comment section response today. Like if you like to like things, comment if you commonly comment on things and want to appear on a future episode, and subscribe. And as I said earlier, share our videos if you really want to help us out, and follow us on the social medias. See you guys next time!